In the middle of the 1300s, there was a celebrity. He was a poet, but also an intellectual and a scholar. He traveled around from town to town to town, astounding audiences with his incredible poetry, some of which was love poetry for some woman named Laurel. But he also presented some pretty radical intellectual ideas that shook people up, had them look at their reality a little bit differently. And ultimately, this guy changed the course of history. He was identified at the time as a humanist, and his name was Petrarch. Petrarch was born in the year 1304 in the Tuscany region of Italy, but he grew up spending most of his childhood in the southern French town of Avignon. As a young man, he experienced spiritual ecstasy while mountain climbing. But it wasn't just mountaineering that provided Petrarch with these incredible emotions of elation. The other thing that inspired Petrarch was antiquity. The ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans, Petrarch loved studying history. Now, that might sound strange to you and I, but Petrarch, when he looked around mid-14th century Europe, he didn't really like what he saw. He saw a land that was filled with ignorance and stupidity and with bad forms of government and oppressive social systems. And he looked back at the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans, and he thought, they had sports, they had the Olympics. The ancient Greeks, they had democracy. The Romans, they had a republic. He loved a particular Roman statesman named Cicero, who believed in maintaining a republic. He looked at the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans, and he saw some of the greatest achievements in the arts, literature, theater, statues, and how about some of those incredible architectural achievements? He looked around, he didn't see any of that in his lifetime. And so he said that when the Roman Empire fell in the year 476, a new era began, an awful era began, which he called the Dark Ages. He believed during his generation, in the 1300s, that the time had come to reach back in time, to revive the Greeks, revive the Romans, to learn their artwork, their literature, their philosophy, their forms of government, and to bring it back. And when we bring it back, we will enhance our life today, today being the 1300s when Petrarch was around. The era that was initiated was an era that historians today call the Renaissance. Now, the Renaissance is a term that came around in the middle of the 19th century. There was nobody walking around Italy in the middle of the 1300s going, hey, we're living during the Renaissance right now. No, it didn't happen like that. It happened much more gradually. And the Renaissance is the era in which our class, AP European History, begins. So welcome, Upper Arlington High School students to AP European History. Henceforth, I will refer to you as the Euro Bears. This is an interesting year. I always struggle with how to begin this class, and I really am struggling this year. How do I begin this class? Um, I don't know. Our, technically, our curriculum begins in the year 1450, or around the year 1450. That's the year that the College Board designates as, here's when AP European History starts. But I never know in any year how to start off this class just in the year 1450 because there's so much that was going on that was building up to the year 1450. There's all this cultural and religious and political and economic stuff that you sort of have to get a, have a context for. So in this re first recorded slideshow lecture, which I have for you today, what I'm going to do is my best to present the world of 1453, an era that today historians call the Renaissance. So in this recorded slideshow lecture, you're going to see a map of Europe, and I'm essentially just going to walk around this map of Europe, talking about France, the Italian city-states, Spain, Russia, the Holy Roman Empire, England, and the Ottoman Empire, and I think that's about it. I'm gonna walk around the map of Europe, I'm gonna talk about what life was like in Europe in the year 1453 specifically.
So that's it. Guys, welcome to AP European History. Hope you enjoy it. Okay, so let's start here. What you're looking at is a map of Europe in the year 1453 when our course begins. It shares some similarities with the current map of Europe and also some glaring big differences. What I will do over the course of the next few minutes is just sort of take a walk around this map drawing your attention to some important areas. And as I talk about some specific areas in Europe from the middle of the 15th century, I would like for you to think of questions. What doesn't make sense? What do I need to explain in more depth? So that mid 15th century Europe can make more sense to you so that it can come more alive. That's what I would like for you to do. Okay, so just a little bit on the structure of society and. 15th century Europe before I start walking around this map, you first need to know that the majority of European civilization, that most of the places in Europe that I'm going to talk about, were organized in a feudal social and economic structure. After Rome fell in the year 476 AD and there was a period of chaos and anarchy, a great deal of warfare fighting for possession of land. And during the periods of time where things settled down, the feudal system emerged as this rather natural structure for things. It was a political and social and economic structure in which everybody knew their place. There was very little question about who you were and the role you played in society. That's very different from growing up in the United States of America today, where you have a great deal of freedom and your station in society, if I can call it that, is very fluid, or at least has the possibility of being very fluid, especially when you think about something like your occupation. You may very well have a variety of career, careers throughout your life. And that was simply not the case in the feudal structure throughout most of Europe in which we find ourselves in the middle of the 15th century. So the feudal system can be very complicated when you go into it in depth, but I'm certainly not going to do that. The best way to start envisioning the feudal society is to, in your mind, imagine a large uh, bit of land, a large country. And we're not going to call that country a country, we're going to call it a kingdom. Because a kingdom belongs to a king, a single monarch whose rules apply to the entire kingdom. Okay, so we start there. Now then take that kingdom and divide it up into large plots of land. And the king grants ownership of that land to the people who have supported him or his family in his being king. And this group of people who are lords over their land... They are nobles and they are knights. Now, on these large tracts of land, these earldoms, the nobles and the knights, which make up this aristocratic class, and they usually have titles like earl or duke or count, they have living on their land peasants. And the peasants are the ones that do the hard work, the manual labor. Almost always this is agriculture, although it could also be potentially construction. But when, when we think of peasants, we almost always think of farmers. And that, for the most part, is my oversimplified explanation of the setup of feudalism. Now, ideally, this should all work out great. You've got the king who gets to be the king. He has about as he gets to live in as much splendor as the day and age allows, which actually isn't very much by today's standards. And the king is the king of the kingdom. And then he takes his land and divides it up to all the nobles and says, hey, this is yours. You have your own huge tract of land and you have peasants to work the land for you. And the nobles say, thank you very much, king. And they have the peasants that work for them, that provide for them food and services or whatever. And the aristocratic class then protects the peasants Ideally, making sure they have shelter, making sure they have enough food for themselves, making sure that while they're living on their land, they're protected from 
rogue wayfarers and thieves and whatever, and that as a whole, everybody is helping each other out. And it's a system. Everybody knows their place. When it comes to things like tax collection, it works pretty simply. The king says to each of the nobles, I want this much from you. And the nobles then use whatever they've collected from what's been produced on their land by the peasants to pay the king those taxes, which will be used ideally for the good of the kingdom as a whole. And when there's a war, it sort of works the same way. The king tells, the, tells each of the nobles, I need this many fighting men from you. And the aristocratic class then, the nobility, they find the fighting men among their peasants and they go off to battle. If you distinguish yourself in battle, if you lead men into battle, then you can become knighted, making you part of the aristocratic class and you get to acquire land. The king has the power to take land away from one nobleman and give it to the other. So you want to be good to the king. Hey, by the way, that happened a lot under Peter the Great in Russia. You had to be really good to Peter the Great, otherwise he would take your land away and give it to somebody else. Also happened a lot around the same time in history, which is the late 1600s, early 1700s, with Louis XIV, the king of France. And then in some kingdoms, like England, the nobility there had their own representative body called Parliament, and their job was to protect their ancient rights and privileges as aristocrats to the king whom they met with. The word feudal means faithful. It was a system based upon faithfulness to both those above you and those below you. So to those above you, you honored them, you respected them, and you did their bidding. You did not complain to them. If your king told you to go to war or your lord told you to grow potatoes, then you did it for the honor of doing it, for the grandeur of your kingdom. And then to those below you, you protected them. You cared for them. So they showed respect and reverence to you, and you in return protected and cared for them. And that in its most simple form is the feudal system. Now, potentially the feudal system should work out ideally, but what it doesn't really take into, a, into account is that human beings, while we have the capacity to be kind and generous and faithful, we also have the capacity to be cruel, to exploit other human beings. And if you have people working for you and they don't really have a choice, well, then increasingly you might take advantage of that. And that causes friction and conflict at all levels. So when we talk about the English Civil War of the middle of the 17th century, those were the aristocrats rising up against the king because they thought the king was cruel. They thought the king was a jerk. So let's replace him. Or what they really did is they killed him. And they tried to rule, rule England by themselves. And then things got more complicated because the peasants in England said, we don't like the way the lords run things. And they rose up against them. So the whole thing became this an just anarchy, this mess. And in the end of all that, we actually ended up with a constitutional monarchy in England by the year 1690. Now, I know I'm jumping way ahead in European history here, giving you a taste of something to come, but hopefully you understand this basic starting block of feudalism and its strengths and its weaknesses. And just sort of understanding this basic general structure will help you to understand the remainder of European history. This feudal structure lasts for quite a while, into the 19th century. And there are even, even remnants of it today. I mean, after all... Great Britain still today has a royal family, as does Spain. Okay, so my description of feudalism is very simplistic. And for our purposes here in Apiro, that's okay. It is worth mentioning, though, that there were some parts of Europe that were outside of the feudal system, sort of. And the first of those are cities. So some of the big cities in Europe, like London in England or Paris in France, there was no lord who ruled over these lands, but rather these big cities belonged to the king. So there was the king's law. There was no lord or knight who ruled over these lands, and then the city developed. Villages could develop in particular earldoms. But big cities like London, Paris, they were sort of outside of the feudal system, 
but they were still part of the, the kingdom a, a, as a whole, obviously. But there was the phrase back then, city air is free air. And the people who lived in the cities were merchants, were traders. These were still low-class people of their day and age. They did not garner the same respect as entrepreneurs do in our more capitalist society today. They certainly did not have the same respect. You could also in the city find doctors, lawyers, and a variety of other craftsmen. Cities are so very important in our study of European history because it's where you have the most people, so it's where the most ideas are exchanged. It's where the most commerce happens. So cities are always on the vanguard of historical developments. The other aspect of society in Europe in the middle of the 16th century that sort of fell outside of the realm of the feudal system was the church. Now, when I say the word the church, and we're talking about the 1450s, it's rather easy. It gets a lot more complicated as we go through European history, especially as when we get our second unit, the Reformation, as you will soon find out. But when I say the church, there is only one church that we talk about as there is only one church, sort of, there's only one church that rules over most of Western Europe. And I got to be careful with the word rules there. Okay, so the one church is the Catholic Church. The word Catholic means universal. The central Catholic Church, the biggest one, the most important one, is St. Peter's in Rome. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a moment when I go on to the next slide and I talk about Italy. But the best way to think of the Catholic Church in the 15th century, in the 14, in 1450, when we start off this course, think of it like a large corporation. It's got its central headquarters, and its headquarters are in Rome. But then it has its branch offices, and the branch offices are all the other churches throughout Europe. And they can be in England, in France, in Spain, in the German states. They can be anywhere, and they are anywhere. All right, and in those branch offices... There are employees. In the case of the church, you're talking about priests, monks, nuns, other lower church officials, other higher church officials, such as a cardinal, as a bishop, and they all work for their big boss, who is the pope, who is in Rome. Okay, now when it comes to those individual church officials, and let's say they work in a church like you see this one here. This is Chartres Cathedral, which is a very famous cathedral in France. So they're, they're here in France. Now, if they're a church official and they're here living in France, where do they fall in in the French feudal system? Well, they don't. Church land is church land. The church owns it. The church runs it. And their rules and their laws apply. So church lands are sort of outside the feudal system, or as the way I explained it, they are outside the feudal system. So why would a king allow for these church lands, and you're talking about millions of acres, why would he permit that in his kingdom? Well, here's where it gets kind of complicated. First of all, the king wants to show that he's a good Christian, and also because it's important for the kings, for each king individual, to be in the good graces of the Pope. Because the Pope, who is a religious authority who lives in Rome, the Pope grants legitimacy to the kings. Yes, this seems weird. A king essentially needs a Pope's blessing to be considered a legitimate king. So let me give you an example of this. In the year 1066, during the Middle Ages, there were two men who claimed that they were the next king of England. One was Duke William of Normandy, which is in northern France today, and the other was King Harold, or, or Harold Godwinson, who had already proclaimed himself king, who was up in England. Well, Duke William of Normandy appealed to the Pope down in Rome, said, I want to be king, and the Pope decided, yes, you, William, have more of a legitimate claim to the throne, gave William's army the papal banner, which said that you know, when this army rode into battle against the English, they carry this banner with them, and it says the Pope is on our side. You are illegitimate. You guys don't have the right to rule. And also what it implies is God is on our side. And when William's army was lucky enough to win that battle in 1066, which was called the Battle of Hastings, by the way, William took over England, 
totally created a new feudal structure. And because the Pope had granted William legitimacy, saying he has the right to rule, then everybody else in Europe has to respect that. So another way to think of the Pope and his institution of the Catholic Church is you can think of him like the United Nations today. If the United Nations say, says that you're not a country, then you are not a country. Or at least you're not a country in the eyes of the rest of the world. So kings had to cooperate with the church. But sometimes, as we find throughout the course of European history, the church and the king don't always have the best relationship, and this causes some tension. And what's the role of the church and all the people who work for the church, the priests, the monks, the nuns? What do they do if they find that their pope is telling them to do one thing and their king is telling them to do another? We will see this conflict between the church and the state government play out very dramatically during the French Revolution, in particular in the year 1790. But that's still a ways off for us. Hopefully you've got a fairly good understanding of the feudal system, of the role of the church and cities, and the way things are structured in general around the year 1450, the middle of the 15th century. I hope it makes sense to you. Okay, so as promised, let's take a little walk around Europe. Let's just walk around the map, look at particular places, and let's talk about, in the most general terms, what's going on there. Okay, so if you look at your screen, you'll see the map of Europe from the year 1453, and I've circled the Italian peninsula. I call it the Italian peninsula because I cannot yet call it Italy. Italy will not be completely unified until the year 1871. In 1453, Italy is very divided. There are particular regions, we call these regions city-states, and they are not united. In fact, they fight each other a lot. The current capital city of Italy today is Rome, and Rome is obviously a very important city. It was the capital of the Roman Empire, which you guys studied in the seventh grade. But after the collapse of the Roman Empire, it maintained its importance because it was the center of the Catholic world. Why was it the center of the Catholic world? Well, because as Christianity was developing in the first century, during the time of the Roman Empire, these early Christians went from town to town to town to spread the word of Christianity and try to get as many people to convert to Christianity as possible, even though Christianity was illegal in the Roman Empire and you would have gotten killed for simply being a Christian. But churches were still established by these early Christians, and one very early Christian by the name of Peter. Peter was a man who actually knew Jesus. Peter came to Rome to establish the church, or to establish a church there in Rome. Now, the Roman church that Peter established was one of many churches that were being established across the Mediterranean world at the time. But Jesus, if we're to believe the Bible, Jesus had told Peter, you are the rock upon which I will build my church. Peter came to Rome, which was the capital city of the empire. He established the, the Christian church there. He was captured and executed by the Romans for being a Christian and establishing a church there. But his followers still continued to have a church, they would meet in secret underground places. Centuries later, Christianity was legalized in the Roman Empire and then actually became the official religion of the Roman Empire. And because of all that, Rome wasn't just the capital of the Roman Empire, it was the capital of the Christian world. And the church there is named after St. Peter. St. Peter's Church, today, St. Peter's Basilica. And today, as I record this lecture, St. Peter's Basilica is the largest cathedral in the world. In the year 476, when the Roman Empire collapsed, there were still many, many people throughout Europe who considered themselves to be Christian and considered the center of the Christian world to be Rome. And whoever the head of the church in Rome was, whoever the father of the Roman church was, was the leader of all the churches. And that church father eventually became known as the Pope. And Peter is considered to be the first Pope. Now, if you can look back at the map, you can hopefully find that little dot that's labeled Rome, and that Rome actually rules over its own land in central Italy. So the Pope is also sort of, at least in effect, a king over a region that we identify as 
the Papal States. Just north of the Papal States, we have a region called Tuscany. Tuscany is not labeled on this map, but the capital of Tuscany is labeled here, Florence. This is the region of Petrarch. This is the region that most historians claim is the center of the Renaissance. But I'll also, and I will talk a lot about Florence, but I will also talk a lot about another city-state that's north of Florence. It is labeled clearly here, Venice. You see Venice located right up there in the crotch of the Adriatic Sea. Because of its geographic location, Venice very much a city of merchants and traders. By the way, Venice, Florence, and Rome, they do not get along with each other. They are highly competitive with each other. They frequently like to fight each other. But Venice, hey, which by the way, Venice was the hometown of Marco Polo. Venice is very much a trading city. It's a city of commerce. So you have a lot of wealth in Venice. We will learn about how modern banking actually got started in Venice during the period of time of the Renaissance. And then that banking system that was copied by people in Florence and modern banking very much played a key role in developing the Renaissance. But it all, that all started up in Venice. And also in Venice, we have a significant Jewish population, which plays a very important role in history. Okay, so there's the Italian peninsula. Let's take a walk a little bit to the east here. Let's go to the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottoman Empire is very unique and a lot different than, a lot of, than most of the other kingdoms that I talk about in Western Europe. The Ottoman Empire is ruled by the Turks. The Turks are Sunni Muslims. Their leader, their emperor, is called a sultan. And as you can tell from what is circled on this map, they hold a key geographic position. They rule the eastern Mediterranean, and they control the Bosporus Straits that connect the Black Sea with the Aegean Sea. And the year 1453 is very important to European and Ottoman history. Ottoman history is part of European history, but 1453 specifically is important to Ottoman history because they captured the city of Constantinople. So take a moment to find the city of Constantinople there. You hopefully can tell that it is in a key geographic location. It's built right along the straits that connect the Black Sea with the Aegean Sea. You control Constantinople and you control all the traffic in between those two bodies of water. And if you can control that traffic and that trade, that's big money right there. Now, Constantinople is an incredible city with a rich history, and I need to talk a little bit about it right now. So the city of Constantinople is named after an emperor named Constantine. Constantine was a Roman emperor. Constantine, before he became a Roman emperor, converted to Christianity. And when he became emperor, he legalized Christianity throughout the Roman em Empire. That was a very important thing that he did as a Roman emperor. The other thing he did was divide up the Roman Empire. He said Rome, the Roman Empire is simply too big. So the western part of the Roman Empire was governed by the city of Rome. And the eastern part of the Roman Empire was governed by Constantinople, a city that Constantine had named after himself. Prior to that city being called Constantinople, it was called Byzantium. So now in the year 476, when the barbarians sack Rome in the West and the Roman Empire collapsed, understand the eastern part of the empire did not. It will survive for another 1,000 years. But we tend not to call it the Roman Empire. We tend to call it the Byzantine Empire. Ruled from the old Byzantine capital, <laughs> or the old, the old city Byzantium, which is now called Constantinople. All right, so Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire and the people of the Byzantine Empire, they considered themselves to be the true inheritors of the Roman Empire. Western Rome, the Western part of the empire had fallen, but they survived and they thrived in terms of their military, their economy. They were strong. They also considered themselves to be the true Christians. So there was a break in the Catholic Church. The people of Constantinople believed that the bishop of Constantinople was the real leader of the Christian world, not whichever guy was in Rome. And there was a religious debate that went on for several centuries about who was the real leader of the Christians. And then finally, in the 11th century, 
they just called off the argument and said, there are two different churches. There's the Roman Catholic Church, and there is the Eastern Orthodox Church. And we have two branches, two branches of the Christian Church. Now, so Byzantium lasts for another thousand years, but then come the Turks. Here come the Ottomans. The Ottomans are not Christian, they're Sunni Muslim, and they want the city of Constantinople. They are creating their own empire. During the Middle Ages, the Christians of Western Europe had proven to the Muslims in the Middle East that they were no friends. The Christians had repeatedly tried to invade Muslim lands through a series of wars called the Crusades. The Ottomans now are creating their own empire, and they are spreading into the Balkan Peninsula. They are taking over the Greek world or the Byzantium world. Several times, the Ottomans had tried to capture the city of Constantinople. And finally they did it in the year 1453. What had enabled the Ottomans, by the way, to capture the city of Constantinople was superior artillery. The Ottomans had huge cannons that would fire cannonballs with such force that when these cannonballs hit the earth, they would drive six feet into the earth. These cannonballs knocked down the walls of Constantinople. In came the Turks to take it over and eventually renamed the city Istanbul. Now, here's what's important to know about the Renaissance and why a lot of historians mark 1453 as the beginning of modern Europe. You had in Byzantium, and specifically in Constantinople, Byzantine monks, Eastern Orthodox Christian monks. These individuals were scholars. And they had maintained in their libraries works of literature that went all the way back to antiquity. And when I say antiquity, I mean ancient Greece. After all, Constantinople is part of the Greek world. So works by individuals like Plato that had long been lost in the West. They survived in the monasteries in the Byzantine world. Now, with the collapse of Constantinople, some of these Byzantine monks packed up and they went west, carrying with them all of these books from antiquity. And they went to Florence. Why Florence? Well, because they were invited to come to Florence. We'll learn more about that later. Now, the Ottoman Turks will, for the next 200 years, make a westward drive into Central Europe, taking over all of southeastern Europe. So as you look at this map and you see places like Hungary, Serbia, Bosnia, Greece, all of these places were ruled by the Turks, by the Ottomans. And at different points of time, all of them will gain their independence from the Ottomans as the Ottoman Empire eventually, piece by piece, collapses. And as those countries go free, they almost invariably cause trouble for the rest of Europe. The collapse of the Ottoman Empire and these freeing of new states and the conflict it creates will actually be one of the central causes of the First World War in 1914. All right, so there's the Ottoman Empire. Let's take a little walk to the west and go to the Iberian Peninsula. When we think of the Iberian Peninsula today, we think of two countries, Portugal and Spain. In the middle of the 15th century, Spain was not yet unified. You had two separate kingdoms, the Kingdom of Castile and the, and the Kingdom of Aragon. And it will be in the 15th century that these two kingdoms will be unified by marriage when a woman, Isabella of Castile, marries a man, Ferdinand of Aragon, and Isabella and Ferdinand will almost have Spain united. But if you look at the map, there's a part on the, in the south there called Granada. Granada is ruled by the Spanish Moors. These are Muslims that invaded Spain from North Africa in the 8th century, and they had ruled the entirety of the Iberian Peninsula. Christians, Jews, and Muslims lived together in relative harmony. Christians and Jews had to pay taxes there because they were not part of the dominant religion. But you had an incredible, an incredible amount of cultural diffusion between those three religious groups. 
making the Iberian Peninsula for about 700 years a very culturally diverse place with a wide variety of foods, architecture, as well as philosophical and technological developments. Spain was a pretty culturally rich place. But in the middle of the Middle Ages, we're talking the 700s, 800s, there was a movement to retake Spain from the Muslims to drive the Muslims back out, to drive the Spanish Moors back out, and to reconquer Spain. This movement was called the Reconquista, the reconquering of Spain. Isabella of Castile, in particular, wants to be the champion of the Reconquista. You still have the Spanish Moors with a toehold in the south of Spain in Granada, and she wants to drive them all out. And she does. The Spanish army drives out the last of the Spanish Moors in the early weeks of the year 1492, Isabella, having capturing the wealthy cities of Granada and all of the riches there, was able to use those riches to finance the three voyages of Christopher Columbus, who Isabella hired to conquer new lands for Spain after Christopher Columbus, who originally came from the Italian land of Genoa, had been turned down by multiple other leaders. That gamble obviously paid off for Isabella of Castile. Christopher Columbus would go on to accidentally arrive at and explore the Caribbean, Central America, and South America, which opened the door for Spanish conquest, and eventually the Spanish Empire, within a hundred years, would be approximately 20 times the size of the Roman Empire and Spain becomes the wealthiest country on earth. Wealthy, but certainly not culturally tolerant. After the Christians had recaptured more Spain, they wanted to make sure that Spain remained Christian, and so therefore began the process of either expelling or converting every Muslim or Jew who lived in Spain. The Jewish and Muslim converts who had chosen to stay in Spain because they considered it to be their homeland were typically not trusted and frequently brutally tortured and killed by a Catholic institution called the Spanish Inquisition. By the time we get to the year 1600, Spain will be extraordinarily wealthy, extraordinarily intolerant, very Catholic, and as we, as we will also see, have a very rigid feudal structure of society that will persist well into the 20th century and actually plays a role leading up to World War II. Now, there's actually one last thing I want to talk about with Spain. If you look up to the northern part of the Iberian Peninsula, you see a region labeled Navarre. Now, Navarre is part of Spain today, at least technically part of Spain. There's a lot of parts of Spain that don't want to be part of Spain today. The region of Catalonia in recent years have been, has been trying to break off and go free. But anyway, Navarre. Navarre is a mountainous area. It's the home of the Basque people. The big city up in Navarre is Bilbao. The Navarre region straddles the Pyrenees Mountains. The Pyrenees Mountains are sort of the, ge is, are the geographical dividing line between Spain and France. Navarre is part of that mountainous region. I'll end up talking a lot about Navarre throughout this course. It's important to know that in the in, in the 15th century, Navarre has more ties to France than it does Spain, and that one of the most important dynasties, one of the most important powerful families in French history, the Bourbon family, they actually originally come from Navarre. So just make sure you know where Navarre is located. Okay, and speaking of France, let's cross the Pyrenees Mountains and go north to France. Now you look at France here on this particular map and you're like, hey, that looks like a unified country. And it is. But unified in the 15th century sense of the word is not the same as unified in the 21st century sense of the word. Throughout France, you have, first of all, a lot of powerful, noble families, a handful of which have some claim to the throne in Paris. And you're going to have a lot of fighting among nobility. And if you were king of France at this time in the middle of the 15th century, you would probably do your best to keep your life and your position by providing land and favors and a lot of autonomy to those powerful families so that they would be nice to you and not, you know, try to kill you and make one of their own sons king. 
So unified, well, only sort of. Also, cultural unity. Understand this. The majority of people who live in France do not speak French throughout French history until you get to the 19th century and the establishment of a national school system in France. So each little corner and pocket of France, they speak their own language. Most of those languages have sadly since been lost. But as you look at this map, France is unified politically. They've got a king. And the experience of the 100 years war that lasted from the 14th century into the 15th century, it strengthened the federal government in Paris. War tends to do this to countries at any point of time in history. You're going to go to war, you need to raise an army, you need to raise taxes, and that takes a strong federal government in order to do those things. And France, throughout most of European history, as we will learn, is one of the most powerful and significant of all the European states. It will be amazing how much time we will spend in this class talking about the French. Almost everything we learn in November and December somehow has something to do with France. We just won't be able to get away from it. Let's go up north to the British Isles. England, Ireland, and Scotland are all their own separate countries, or kingdoms. I guess kingdoms are the, is the better word to use here. But understand that England had, in the centuries before, taken over their neighbor, Wales. And England has also conquered part of the island of Ireland, and in particular that city that sits right across the Irish Sea from England, Dublin. But in the year 1453, most of the people who live in Ireland beyond the pale of the English settlement, they speak Celtic, they are Catholic, they are proudly Catholic, they defended themselves from the Vikings, or they protected their Catholicism from the Vikings, and they are mostly free of English rule. Sadly, that will change, especially when we get to the 16th century. North of England, you have Scotland. Scotland is its own kingdom with its own king. Scotland and England do not like each other. They've had a hostile relationship for quite some time. The, Eng the English look down upon the Irish as being barbaric savages. The Irish look upon the English as cruel imperialists who are trying to take their land. The English, like the French, have a strong central government in London. Just like the case with the French, the government in London became extraordinarily strong and powerful during the Hundred Years' War as well. We will learn a lot about the power of the British monarchs, especially in the 16th century, the 1500s, the rising power of their parliament in the following century, the conflicts between these three countries, England, Ireland, and Scotland, and then eventually the emergence of a democracy in England, or at least the beginnings of a democracy, a constitutional monarchy, because England is an island country, they will develop an incredibly powerful navy that in the 18th and 19th century will enable them to rule over one-fifth of the world's population. England will also be the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century. As I personally am presenting this lecture, I'm presenting it in the language of English, and I'm recording this in North America. The influence and the impact of the English cannot be underestimated, and we will certainly be learning all about that throughout the course of this year. All right, so let's hop across the English Channel and go into Central Europe, and let's talk about a region that is not around anymore today called the Holy Roman Empire. Now, the Holy Roman Empire is made up of mostly German-speaking states, although similar to France at this point in time in history, there's no real standard German, and what they speak in the city of Cologne is very different from what they speak in the city of Berlin, which is also very different from the German that they speak down in, like, Bern, Switzerland. But there's also Eastern European languages and Eastern European people, like the Czechs, who live in Prague, in a region back then they called Bohemia. So there are a wide variety of people, a wide variety of cultures, a wide variety of languages that make up this huge region in Central Europe called the Holy Roman Empire. And just what is this 
Holy Roman Empire? Well, okay, well, let's start here. First of all, do not be foolish and think that this is the Roman Empire or that this is even anything left over from the Roman Empire. It is not. So the ancient Roman Empire that you learned about in the seventh grade, the Roman Empire that collapsed in the year 476, this is not to be confused with the Holy Roman Empire. So the story of the Holy Roman Empire actually goes back to the year 800, and specifically to Christmas Day of the year 800, December 25th, 800. There was a French king, his name was Charlemagne. Charlemagne is French for Charles the Great. And he probably was the greatest king of the Middle Ages in that he created an empire. He'd gone down south, crossed the Pyrenees Mountains to try to fight the Moors in Spain. Famously, he lost those battles. He also expanded westward and conquered people like the Saxons and the German-speaking states. And Charlemagne even though he was illiterate for the most part and quite a warmonger, constantly expanding his lands, he also identified as a Christian and wanted to make sure that everybody in his empire was Christian. So he was, whenever he conquered somebody like the Saxons, he forced them to embrace Christianity or die by the sword. So he expanded his kingdom, known as the Kingdom of the Franks, well into Central Europe. And as he's doing that, he's spreading Christianity. Now, there's a couple of important consequences to this spreading of Christianity by Charlemagne into Central Europe. The first is of which is it catches the attention of the Pope who wants to honor Charlemagne. So the Pope invites Charlemagne down to Rome to celebrate Christmas Mass with him on Christmas Day, December the 25th of the year 800. And during this Christmas service, in the original St. Peter's Church in Rome, the Pope decides to honor the king of the Franks, Charlemagne, by calling him forth to the altar, having Charlemagne kneel before him. And the Pope presented a crown to Charlemagne, crowns the head of Charlemagne, as Charlemagne is kneeling down before the Pope, and the Pope proclaims that he, Charlemagne, had created a new Christian empire and that this empire was going to be called the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, so what does that name mean? Holy in that it is Christian. Roman in that the kings, or rather the emperors of this empire, all submit to the church authority in Rome. So that's what makes it holy, and that's what makes it Roman. It's an empire because there's a wide variety of peoples and cultures and languages. Okay, does that make sense? <laughs> I hope it does. There have been a lot of jokes made about the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, most famously in the 18th century, the French comedian, the French wit Voltaire said, the Holy Roman Empire is neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. And yes, that's funny, but hopefully you understand this is why the Holy Roman Empire is called such. Now, Charlemagne was French. France, as you see, is not part of the Holy Roman Empire. So what happened there? Well, easy. Charlemagne died. His descendants, who all wanted to succeed to, to take over his huge empire, all fought and bickered with each other, and eventually the empire got split up. So we have France and we have the Holy Roman Empire. So now it's 1453. What is the Holy Roman Empire? It's not part of France. It's its own separate political thing. Okay, so politically, here's what the Holy Roman Empire is, and this is complicated, and I will do my very best to explain it. It sort of has its own feudal system, but there's no specific king in a particular city. There's no real capital of the Holy Roman Empire. But you do have powerful monarchs, powerful kings, who rule over regions in the Holy Roman Empire. Specifically, you have seven rulers of the Holy Roman Empire. These rulers are called electors, seven electors, and they all come from particular regions. Now, one of these electors has the opportunity of being the head elector, of being 
the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. And this individual is selected by the other electors. So the electors will, when the occasion presents itself, all get together at a particular city. This meeting is called a diet. Diet is spelled D-I-E-T, like how we spell our word in English, diet. So they meet at a meeting, a diet, and they all select who the next emperor is going to be among them. So this is essentially a meeting of equals. The electors are all very powerful individuals, all very powerful men. And you can imagine if you want to be the emperor, you must make significant promises to the other electors that they will be allowed to govern their own regions however they want. And the job of the emperor then is to keep the peace among them and also to organize them in times of war. Let's say if the Turks are invading on their borders, then the emperor would be responsible for the mobilization for war. So that is the structure of the Holy Roman Empire. I hope that made sense. Please ask me questions if it didn't, if there was something in there that didn't make sense. Okay, now, for our convenience, throughout the entirety of our story of European history from 1453 to present, there was only one family that ruled as Holy Roman Emperor. So it didn't really bounce around from elector to elector to elector. And that family was the Habsburg family. Their home region was Austria. Their capital city, Vienna. The first Habsburg emperor was elected in the year 1440, right before the story, our telling of the story of European history begins. And the last one, the last one was stripped of his power during, or rather immediately after, the First World War. So the story of the Holy Roman Empire is the story of the Habsburgs. The Habsburgs, one of the dominant families of European history, and we'll certainly be hearing about the Habsburg family quite a bit. Okay, so I think that's all I have to say about the Holy Roman Empire. Let's walk east on our map and, and enter a land that we call today Russia. Now, Russia doesn't really exist prior to the 13th century. But actually, let me take it back a little bit further than that. And actually, let me leave Russia here for a second and bring in another part of Europe. Most of you are probably familiar with the Nordic invaders of the Middle Ages, called the Vikings. And the Vikings ruled a wide variety of areas throughout the Middle Ages. On this map that you see here, the countries of Norway, Sweden, Denmark, these regions were settled by Vikings. The Vikings invaded the British Isles numerous times. They also established Normandy, Normandy on the northern coast of France. So many of you are familiar with Normandy as the landing site for the D-Day invasions in June of 1944 during World War II. Normandy was the land of the Normans, the Northmen. These were Vikings. Also Iceland, Greenland, also Viking settlements. And for a brief period of time, long before Christopher Columbus, the Vikings made it over to North America. Archaeologists have discovered Viking settlements in Canada that predate Christopher Columbus's arrival in the Caribbean by nearly 500 years. Not quite 500, but almost. So the Vikings were everywhere. And they were also in Eastern Europe, too. Starting in the Baltic Sea, they would work their way down some of those major rivers, some of those major arteries in Eastern Europe. So they explored rivers like the Don and the Volga River. And they established some permanent settlements along the lands in Eastern Europe. One of those settlements was the city of Kiev along the Dnieper River. Kiev is today the current capital of Ukraine. These weren't just Vikings that lived in Kiev. There was a great deal of cultural diffusion, especially as people got married and families were created and families married into other families. And there is no clear, you know, straight Viking ancestry here. But these people in Kiev became known as the Kievan Rus, influenced in the early Middle Ages by the Christians of Constantinople, the Kievan Rus became Christians. Then in the 13th, 13th century, that's the 1200s, from the east come the Mongolian horde. 
As the Mongolians created their land empire, they conquered the city of Kiev. They conquered nearly all of Eastern Europe and all of what we call today Russia. So the Kievan Rus are conquered by the Mongolians. The city of Kiev will obviously survive. It will go on to be the capital of Ukraine. But now let's shift our focus northward. There are other Russian people that have been conquered by the Mongolians who are living in what I'm going to describe as a large village called Moscow. Moscow was not much in the 13th century. Now, for the Russian people who lived in and around Moscow during the time of Mongolian rule, they could continue to own and rule over their land. They simply had to pay tribute to the Mongolians. So think of it like taxes. Now, what happened, and I am going to simplify a lot here, was that these noblemen who were landowners, who were Russian, eventually start to unify themselves into what we call the Duchy of Muscovy. And the dream is born, hey, if we can unite, if we can raise our own army, if we could drive out the Mongolians, who they started calling the Golden Horde, if we can drive out these Mongolians, drive out the Golden Horde, horde <laughs> then, then we can rule our own Muscovite state and maybe even expand Muscovy to rule over all of the Russian people, whom we consider our ethnic countrymen. Okay, so this is what happens. Now let me give you some terms associated with all of this. These Russian noblemen, they will eventually be called boyars, B-O-Y-A-R-S, Russian nobility. They will free themselves from the golden, the golden Horde, these are the Mongolians, but that doesn't happen finally until the year 1480. And then they're free. Then they're free, right? They have their own sort of police force, their, their own army, and the army of the boyars is called the Streltsy. The Streltsy is the militia that works for and protects the boyars. Okay, are you following all this? One last term. So you've got a bunch of boyars, right? That makes governance difficult. So the boyars begin to elect an individual who will be their ruler. But this ruler is democratically elected by the boyars, at least originally. So very similar to how in the Holy Roman Empire, it was the electors selecting an emperor. Same deal originally in Muscovy. And the boyars elected their emperor, who they identified as a czar. Czar is the Russian word for Caesar. Eventually, what the Muscovite rulers ruled expands to include the Russian people as a whole. And Moscow starts off as the capital of Russia. So in the year 1453, Russia's just in the process of being born. They're still about 30 years away from kicking out all of the Mongolians and then establishing their own, own empire, which will include Eastern Europe and Asia, and will eventually grow to become the largest country in the world today, at least in terms of sheer size. Now, there's something important culturally and geographically important to understand about Russia, and let's first talk about religion. So remember, when the Roman Empire collapsed in the year 476, Byzantines still continued to survive in the East, and they said, well, we are the inheritors of the Roman Empire. But then they're taken over in the year 1453, and all those Byzantine monks and priests and such, they flee to Florence in Italy, carrying with them their books from antiquity. So after that, the Russians, and remember, the Russians were originally inspired to become Christians in Kiev as they were inspired by the culture of Constantinople. So the Russians considered themselves to be the inheritors of the original Christians. And you'll sometimes hear Moscow being referred to as the Third Rome. The first Rome being Rome, the second Rome being Constantinople, and the third Rome being Moscow. So there's this strong pride, and it still exists in Russia today to a certain extent, that the Russian Orthodox Christians are the real Christians. The Russian Orthodox Church plays a very significant role in Russian history. And sometimes Russian rulers are 
in harmony with the with the Russian Orthodox Church. They're working cooperatively with the Russian Orthodox Church, and other times they're in complete conflict with the Russian Orthodox Church because the Russian Orthodox Church does so much to dominate the culture and the politics and the governance of Russia throughout much of Russian history, and it, and it still plays a role today. So that's important to know. And then I also mentioned geography. So Russia is a huge country, but it is also, as we start off in the, the dawn of the 15th century, I'm sorry, the dawn of the 16th century, rather, the beginnings of the 1500s, Russia's landlocked. It's huge, but it's landlocked. So it's got agriculture, and that's it. If it wants to do any trade, it's got to go through other countries. It has no navy. So as we get into Russian history, what you'll find is Russia trying to punch its way out to a sea, a seaport, and, and to have a, a, a coastal presence so that it can trade, it can have a navy. Uh, and so two countries to focus on here. The first is Sweden. Peter the Great is going to fight Sweden and establish uh, the city of St. Petersburg along the, co along the Gulf of Finland. And that will be a monumental event in Russian history. Peter the Great will make St. Petersburg the capital. He'll move the capital away from Moscow to St. Petersburg. And then down south, the Russians are going to continually fight the Ottomans. Now, they fight the Ottomans for geographical reasons and for religious reasons. And the religious reason is just really propaganda for the, for the geographical reasons for fighting. So even when the Russians are able to fight the Ottomans to get a port on the Black Sea, you know, if you look at the map, if you've got a port on the Black Sea, and you have control of that Crimean Peninsula there on the Black Sea, well, you still have to sail through Turkish, Turkish waters as you go past Istanbul, through the Bosporus Straits, and, um, and down into the Aegean. And I'm sorry, I keep calling it the Bosporus Straits. I should pronounce it correctly, the Bosphorus Straits. Sorry about that. So anyway, they're going to have to, they're going to be continually fighting the Ottomans for possession of that territory. Now they'll use religion as a propaganda motive behind these wars because the Russians are Eastern Orthodox Christians. They're Russian Orthodox, they're Christians. And the Ottomans are, of course, Muslim. And so throughout Russian history, you've got this grand design to take Constantinople back from the Turks and restore this once great Christian capital. And that creates this drive for this spiritual crusade for many Russians throughout Russian history up to at least the First World War. But as we finish off here, it's important to know that Russia will fight many battles, many wars along its southern borders against the Ottoman Turks and others, but the Ottoman Turks especially, so that Russia can have a warm water port and greater access to the seas. All right, guys. So, hey, I think that's it. Hopefully this provides you with a good background for Europe in the year 1453. And so when you look at the map, you, you know what you're looking at. You have a good general sense of, okay, here's what's going on. But I'm sure you must have some unanswered questions or questions that developed as I was describing Europe in 1453. And I'm pretty excited to find out what those questions are. So there you go. And hey, congratulations. You survived your first recorded slideshow lecture. I'll talk to you later. Have a great day, Eurobears.